we get a chance to, it's not that we don't do this all the time anyway, but really a time to recognize why we are really here and the Jesus that we really serve and his benefit is here right before us all. Imagine someone giving their life for you. You know, uh, that's a sobering thought when you stop and think about that. If you have your Bibles or your phones or whatever, tablets, you will go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and just want to read uh, a few excerpts of that and briefly we'll discuss this and then we will have our communion and then I'll let you have the rest of your day off. But it's great to be in the presence of God. Did you sense the presence of God this morning as we were singing those hymns and songs? I don't know about you, but I did. Scripture says in uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, starting now with verse 1. He said, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that is the quintessential of the love of God when he talks about his son. Jesus Christ. You know, no form, no majesty, no beauty that we should desire him, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows. That's the humanity of Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I, I love that portion because it puts me right in the right perspective of somebody who has lived life as human but fully God at the same time. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and esteemed, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, and he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. For we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Lord, we pray this morning that you will bless your word, that you will give us listening ears and attentive hearts to receive all that you have for us today. We thank you, Lord, that God, you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This morning, I want to talk or speak briefly Really, when I hear these wonderful scriptures here, the will of God, because that encapsulates everything that is before us. The will of God is another way, actually, of saying the law of God. It is equal of saying knowing God and knowing God's law. It's like saying knowing God's will. Now we said, how do the law which is the Old Testament aligned with the grace and mercy in the New Testament. It's still the will of God. We still have to follow laws. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get around slow drivers that's doing 40 miles an hour and I'm doing 65 or 70 and they irritate me because I feel that they are not following the law, at least through the speed limit. Anybody besides me has had that happen? You come up on them and you say, uh, are they okay? And you look over there at them and they're just driving like they're in the fast lane and like, hey, I'm, I'm not going nowhere. We can tell. And so it's those things there. So God's law instructs us on how we should live. 
So the law basically means instructions. It includes the entire written word of God. Did you know that everything we do in life is going to require some instructions? That we got to follow some rules. Now, like most men, and I'm not saying every man, but particularly myself, when I get something that's in the mail or whatnot, I don't want to read the instructions. I just open it up and I say, oh, I can put this together until I run into a problem. And then my mind comes back to me, hey, you know what? You may be better off if you read the instructions. And then I missed a piece of it. And if I had read the instructions, I wouldn't have had to redo it over again. That's why we have signs that say, don't turn here, turn down. Don't turn right on the light, you know, and things of that nature. Because there may be a police officer that's right there waiting for you to make that turn, and you shouldn't have turned. And then we say, but I didn't see it. Well, ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? The same as you have the opportunity to make a choice about your life every day of your life. And so when we meet Jesus, we can't say, hey, Lord, nobody never told me about the word of God. Nobody never said anything about Jesus Christ. What does Easter mean? The bunny rabbit and the eggs? No, that's commercialized. The egg, the bunny actually was fraternity, all about having babies and stuff for the great gods. But God himself, Good Friday was on this past Friday when Jesus was crucified. And so we symbolize today, three days later, he raised again. And today is a resurrected Sunday. For believers, we say there's a Good Friday and there's a resurrected Sunday. For unbelievers, they say it's Easter because it's a man-made commercial ordeal. And they make millions and billions off of selling baskets and eggs because they use the eggs as a symbol of fertility. So when we look at this, God's will refers to his purpose and his plans for us and the world. The will of God is also expressed in anything God desires. Think about it. As parents, we desire the very best for our children. Now, I grew up as a farmer. We didn't have much. In fact, uh, my parents couldn't wait until summer because they weren't going to buy no more shoes. Your shoes was going to be your feet. And we went all summer long on dirt roads, and it didn't even phase us. We would run through the woods with no shoes on. People said, no wonder you got them bare feet. And yeah, they were bare feet. I mean, they could go through just about anything that a bear would go through. And But we realized we didn't have much, but they desired the very best for us for what little bit they had. And that's what God does. This is considered his perfect will and plan because this ideally is what he wants for you and me. But God has to take us through something. He wants us to have his best and his highest purpose. Imagine that. I want to have the best for you and I want to give you my highest purpose. But there are some qualifications for that, right? You don't just get, get, get. It's free. But that's going to, be a, that's going to have to be an adjustment in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. That's got to be an adjustment. You can't live any old kind of way and get God's blessings. Now, it's like parents are saying, I want to provide this for you. But you are rejecting me. I don't want nothing from you. Oh, oh, you don't? Oh, okay. There will be a day that you will want something from me. And so we sometimes want to reject our parents because by the time we get of age to appreciate our parents, we have kids that don't appreciate us. Then we realize, wow, that hurts. It is God's revealed will or desire that everyone be saved. And we say, well, how can salvation equate to God's death? Because it's the ultimate price that he paid for you and me. He paid a price. 
You know, again, I go back to parents. Parents sacrifice a lot when they have children. And I, I, I call it, I, I call it the, the circle of life. To and the circle of life for me personally, you take it for what it's worth to you. But the circle of life is just right. Even if it doesn't work, if you have done it, you have you have gone through the circle of life. One is salvation. Have you committed your life to the Lord? Have you I said, Lord, I'm going to surrender my life to you? What does that mean, Pastor? That means that something has to change. I'm going to push this old man to the side. I'm going to come to the knowledge and understanding of the word of God. Lord, I'm going to sincerely ask you into my life to change me, to make me a better person because I can't do it on my own. But when you do see that encounter with God and it happens, then you're going to see a transformation. You know, they said, how do you know that there is change in your life? Oh, you know. It's like I used to wonder, how do you know if there was a question, how do you know if you lost weight? What's the first thing you know if you lost weight? Oh, your clothes will tell you. And they don't even speak. But they'll tell you. I used to swear out. I said, oh, something is wrong with my clothes. This is really, really too tight. I said, I must have left them in the closet too long. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the reality is that they, they talk to you, but they're very sour. You, you're not getting in this today. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't care how much you squeeze in your gut. You ain't getting in this unless you put a belt around it and put a big shirt on top of it so nobody can see you. You can't zip it up. Yeah, I've done that. It's shamefully. But those are the things. But see, God wants to offer us something bigger than anything else the world could ever offer us. That's why God's revealed will and the desire is for us to have his very best. Scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, 4, 5, and 6, he says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So we know that the scriptures all through the Bible talks about the love of Jesus for you and me. He gave his life. He gave his life. You know, there's nothing more important than to see a mother, how she loves her children. I had the opportunity to speak with someone the other day, and they told me, they said, you know, my daughter was acting out in school. And she was doing some things she had no business doing. So, you know, as techy as I am on the phone, I put everything on her, every movement she made. Why are you in that bathroom for so long? Why are you in that? Why are you with those people? So she went up and the, and the kid was getting really rebellious against the mother talking back to her. She said, oh, you don't know who I am. I am Mother Bear. I will come and take your part. You are not going to. I am going to protect my children from getting involved in junk. Call me crazy if you want to. I'm an old fashioned mama. She went to the school and she camped on her while she was sitting in the cafeteria. And then the little girl began to act back with her. She said, and she spoke up, I know you didn't say that to me, because I will rise up in here. She sat down. See, sometimes people got to be put in order. There's rules. There's regulations. If you don't like the rules, then move out, and all of a sudden, get your own rules. Now, that shuts people down, right? But see, God has rules and regulations and obedience that we must adhere to. As an old saying, the truth does not mean that everyone will be saved and surrender their life to Christ. But God desires that everyone will be spiritually saved. That's his desire. Now, now here's the deal. That God will never force himself on you and me. Now, we parents, we'll go crazy sometimes when our kids start acting up and they turn teenagers and they start talking back and then they think that they're bringing the bread home. 
and ain't bringing nothing home but their bodies and want to sleep in your bed? That is not too cool, right? So he, when this happens, Everything begins to change. Now, when God, listen, when God begins to change you, he has to break you down. And so this is what I call the circle of life. The circle of life is a person coming to the knowledge and understanding of Jesus and truly commits their life to Christ. The second part of that is a person getting married, whether it works out or not, right? But they have been married. The third is having children. And I call that the full circle of life because every one of those full circles of life portions make you, break you, and tear you down and rebuild you. Because you can't think the same. You can't think the same when you have come to Jesus because he said, behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You can't think the same when you are married. You can, but how many of you know that ain't going to work out too long? You got to share the love with each other. You certainly can't think the same when you are rearing children because that's a different animal in and of itself. So you have a choice. When you submit your life to Christ, he's going to sort of imagine this. you got a vehicle and you want to keep it. and But it needs an engine. So God sort of takes the engine out of us, which is the old man, puts it to the side and puts a new spirit within you and then he builds on top of that. And the first thing he's going to start building is your character. So, that's a story in ancient time, ancient channel, uh, China. The people desire to place a security around them to keep the barbarian hoarders away. So, they, they went out to build the Great Wall of China. They built the wall because it was too high to go over, it was too thick to break down, and too long to go around. However, for the first hundred years of the Great Wall of China, it was invaded three times. And people ask the question, how could that possibly be? Because during those three times that the Great Wall of China was invaded, it was invaded over the fact that somebody climbed over it because it was too tall, or someone knocked it down because it was too thick, or they went around it because it was too long. No. So you said, how in the world can somebody invade the wall of China with that? Well, the wall itself was not a failure. Then how did the barbarians get over the wall? The fatal flaw in the Chinese is that it was a human error. You see, what they did was they bribed the gatekeeper. And because they bribed the gatekeeper, guess what happened? The whole army of the barbarians walked and marched right in front of the front gate. Now, the question is to be bad. They said, how is this possible? Well, the Chinese defense was placing too much reliance on the wall and putting not enough effort into building the character of the gatekeeper. And you see, and that's what Jesus does. He builds the character of his people once he takes our old nature out and transforms it and all of a sudden, a sudden something new begins to evolve. That's what God does. That's to be, he said, you know what? I'm going to slowly but surely remove the old man or woman and I'm going to place a new soul, a new spirit, a new mind. That's why he goes back and he says, brethren, I urge you by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And then he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How many of you know it takes some time for that to happen? Yes. It takes work, doesn't it? It takes discipline, doesn't it? It takes obedience. It takes sacrifice. It takes giving up you, like the Apostle Paul said in 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because we recognize one thing. When we have submitted and committed our life to Christ, we are no longer that same person. Amen. Something new has taken place, and we have been changed and transformed, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, say the Lord God Almighty. And that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. It's been said that the truth understood is of no value. But it's truth acted upon the changes things. Truth understood is no value. I can tell you the word of God verbatim in so many instances. But if it's not applicable with action, how many of you know it doesn't mean anything? I can give you a brand new car, but unless you turn the ignition or put your hands now in the right place with the key on you, you ain't going to be able to start the vehicle. And you got to drive it. So to serve God, that has to use the action form of acting on it. God does not force anyone to believe him or accept his son as Jesus Christ. It is a choice. Whether or not we entrust our lives to Christ, you have a choice. You and I, every day, have a choice whether we're going to serve the resurrected Christ. Millions of people around the world today are in church. And they come for various reasons because this is the fullest time that every church is going to be filled. It's every pastor's dream to have all of Easter Sunday, per se, according to the world. If it was Easter Sunday every Sunday, how many of you know the world would have no problem? Amen. 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 The world wouldn't have no problem, friend. Most of, we, most of us won't see you until next year this time. <laughs> That's a sad ordeal, but I appreciate the day. I wish you would come back, and my prayer is that you will. But again, God don't force you. He don't lay a tip on you. It's your choice. We are free to refuse a personal relationship with him and remain spiritual lost. You know, it's an amazing thing. And, and I almost missed something this week. Somebody said, oh, I, ha I have a gift for you. I said, no, no, they told me what is that? I said, no, I don't want to, I don't know. They said, can you at least look at the gift? And I had never done that before. So they gave me the gift. And I had to repent because I wanted that gift so bad. After I saw it, I said, oh my God. I was going to turn that down. How stupid. I said, you know what? I re first I repented to God because somebody was going to give me something and I was going to turn it down. And I hadn't seen it. Secondly, I repented to the person and said, I'm so sorry for even thinking like that. I don't usually do that. But you taught me a very valuable lesson and that will never happen again. And so we have to constantly learn, right, that God has gifts for us, but he can't relinquish those gifts to you until he can entrust them to you. You know, have you seen some, uh, I was talking to somebody the other night and, uh, you know, around my grandkids, we don't, we don't use words that are bad words, right? So I was talking to somebody and I said the word, I said, oh, that's so stupid. And I don't usually say that. My grandkid ran and told my daughter, she said, uh, mama, mama, GP, they call me GP, not grandpa, right? I have this thing, call me GP. Don't be calling me no grandpa. <laughs> Too young to be grandpa, so call me GP. So we had to teach her that. So she says, mommy, mommy, GP said a bad word. But what did he say? He says, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and so my daughter corrected me on it and said, Dad, you can't say that. I said, I'm so sorry. So I went back and I apologized to my granddaughter and I apologized to my daughter. I said, you're right, because I don't say those words. I mean, you know, look, my kids came from a family, wasn't right, but we raised them that we didn't even argue in front of them for the first 15 years. And they thought we were a perfect couple. I said, girl, we had more problems than anybody else in the church. What are you talking about? We just, we just knew the right place at the time to discuss our business. And, but we set up a falsification for them, thinking there was a perfect family. There wasn't no perfect family. Shoot, I wanted to come unglued them many times, so did your mother. But we were able to contain that because it was self-control. Because and that's one thing that you got to be able to do when you serve Jesus. You got to have some self-control. You can't say everything you think. You can't do everything you want to do. You can't go to every place you want to go. If you're going to really serve God. We have lost three to four generations in the last 50 years. You know why? Because we as parents then hold our ground or our belief in value systems. And we kind of broke away from that. But when you serve God, you got to have a value system. You got to say, no, this is a non-negotiable. You ever heard that? Non-negotiables. You got to have non-negotiables in your life if you're going to serve God for him. How many of you know you can't have a job and say, you know what? I'm never going back to work. That ain't no job. You don't have one. I'm just going to work at home. Well, they're calling you back today. They're calling you up like the reserves in the military. You better come back here and say, no, I'm not going back. Then you don't have a job. You know, my, my, my mom and dad used to raise us in a way that they would say to us, uh, look, no woman wants a lazy man. Amen? No woman wants a lazy man. No woman wants a man who can't provide. No woman wants a man, hey, I'm seeing you something to do. No, that ain't going to work, right? But they want a man that they know who can provide. And how do you know that we got a Jesus that's going to always provide? That's just the way it is, folks. So we are free to refuse a personal relationship with him and yet remain spiritually dead. But he gives us a gift. We know not. And I always say this, you and I know not when you and I came into the world. Did you know that? You, you have no remembrance when you came through the birth canal of your mom. The only proof we have is one, that you are here. Two, you have a legal document, which is a birth certificate, and your parents birth you. But you have no recollection when you came into this world. Neither will you have a recollection when you leave out of this world. Now, the only thing that you have, the only thing that you have, you have no idea when you came in. You have no idea when you're going to leave. But you can have an idea, grandiosis, when, where you're going. Amen? Amen. As long as you know where you're going. Now, there are people, you know what? I, I hear preachers all the time that say, look, I hate to, I hate to preach funerals that I got to lie. I said, oh, I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to give it there. I'm gonna tell, I don't know the person. They try to put the person that's lived like a sinner all the days, and they're going to put them in heaven. I'm not going to preach you in heaven or hell. I'm just going to tell the truth. That's between you and God now. But you know the scripture says that after you leave this earth, there is a judgment that we got to bear. That's a judgment. And I don't know about, and I'm not here to preach uh, gloom and doom. I'm just here to tell you the truth, right? And again, it's the truth that should set you free with the actions that you put behind it. Right? I mean, it, that's why we want to raise up our children in the fear and nurture of the Lord. So when they go astray, they can remember what the parents have said, and they'll come back. They'll come back, not to the house, but come back to Jesus. Amen? <laughs> they'll come back to Jesus. You know, God's mercy is something, isn't it? 
I, I, I leave you with this, and I close with this. God's, God's mercy is something. I recall reading a story once of a woman who was from the slums of London. And she was taken and invited to go on a group trip with a bunch of people for a holiday at the ocean. Now granted, she had never seen the ocean in her entire life. And she was quite overwhelmed by its beauty. And so she began to point and just a flood of tears began to roll down off of her eyes. And they could not figure out, why are you crying? And as she pointed and crying and tears steaming down her eyes, she points and she says, it's the only thing I ever seen that there is enough of. And when I thought about that, it's like God's mercy is enough. <clears throat> there is enough of it. And he delights to show his mercy and compassion to you and me. That's the way the ocean is. Every once in a while, I feel a little down and out. I just take a ride to the great white, the great highways in San Francisco and get over that hump. And it always just breathtaking to me. I get over that little hump, boom. And all of a sudden, it's like the ocean is coming to right to you, especially on a beautiful day like this. And it's quite overwhelming because there's more than enough of it. So it's more than enough of God's grace and his mercy for you and me. Amen. But you have to accept it. You have to accept it. So you might not be all the way in or half the way in, but I never know. Look, I, I came from a family of uh, military men and women who spent careers in it. They went, spent 20, 30 years in Navy, Army, Marines, uh, Air Force. Uh, all of my cousins, they were in the military. My brothers, I didn't quite make it. <laughs> they were scared there. But I know one thing. If I had made it, I wouldn't have said, Lord, Lord. And somebody would have asked me, hey, did you ever get shot? I would have said, hey, you know what? I, I don't mind getting a little shot, but not all the shot. Mm -hmm. Nobody never talks like that, right? You don't, you don't talk like that. So you can't get a little of Jesus and not all of him. You see, God is a jealous God. He don't put up with part of you because he didn't bring part of you into the world. He didn't say, you know what? I'm not going to give you all of that, but I'm going to give you a little bit of this. No, he brings all of us into the world. Regardless what our mishaps or disabilities may be, he brings us into the world because he has a will and a purpose for whatever that may be. Okay. And so when we come to Jesus, we have to surrender all, not part of us. He wants all of us because if he gets all of us, you know what? His glory will be magnified. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The devil is after your soul. He's after your soul. If you don't think so, I tell you, I, I tell you how you know that the devil is after your soul. If you're doing everything possible to keep from coming to Jesus and you think that you're happy, the devil has you. He ain't got to fight for you. But if you're living for God and things are going haywire and the devil's trying to stick his finger in every issue of your life, you're doing something right. Because the devil will never let up. Because he wants your soul. This is why I say, look, when you serve God and you know where you're going after you leave here, this is the worst hell that you would ever do. But if you don't serve God and you think that you're living the way you want to live, which we do at times, this is the best heaven that you'll ever endure. Because there is a judgment day for us all. But see, Jesus paid the price. He paid the ultimate price for you and I. And I tell you, I'd rather be in the will of God to have his purpose and plan for my life than to be out of the will of God and not know where I'm going. Would you stand with me this morning?
Thank you.